Black History Month was started in the U.S. in 1970. Black contributions in tech go back much further. From the Egyptian pyramids to the astronomy of the Dogon people, the tempo, the beat of innovation has only been matched by the spirit of the people. President Truman once said, the only thing new is history you don't know. So today let's take a journey, but it won't be slow. Every time I use my cell, I should thank James West for the mic that's in there he helped make through much stress, but I digress. Silicon Valley, Engineering Hall of Fame, let's take a tally. Frank Green with Fairchild, Roy Clay Jr. with HP, which brings us to Marion Croak's 100 patents for VOIP, Mary Van Britten Brown, Closed Circuit TV Security. Surely, this list hasn't been covered thoroughly. But I need to save time for Jesse Russell, the father of 2G. He developed an innovation that connects you and me. He had a vision for connections that you cannot see. Kind of like Intel. Slick if you ask me. But speaking of Shirley, I can't forget Dr. Jackson. First black woman with a PhD from MIT? That's quite exceptional to me. These people made an impact despite the stress of second guessing, fighting through discrimination to make quite the impression. We all have biases, but we can make different choices. Many voices, one intel. Wow, good morning everyone. Let's give it up again for our drum performance and a performance by Robert Jarvis Jr. Good morning, everyone. My name is Christy Barrows, and I am one of the cross-site leads for the Oregon Network of Intel African Ancestry. I'm so excited that you're able to join us here today in Oregon and also on the webcast as we kick off our Black History Month, month of excellent, wonderful events and, and remembrances. Um, so without any further ado, um, I would love to turn it over for a message from our NIA executive sponsor, Tom Lanch. Good morning, Nia. In 2020, we celebrate the 25th anniversary of the formation of Nia. As the executive sponsor of Nia, I've been delighted to be able to spend time with the leadership of this organization over the last two years. And what I'm most proud about actually is what you've done yourself this last year as you've led the organization to demonstrate how inclusive it is by what would be viewed as maybe a simple thing by changing your name from the network of Intel African Americans to the network of Intel of African ancestry. It just demonstrates even in our areas of underrepresented minorities that we too can somewhat become fixated and, and, and non-inclusive. But I think this move on a global scale really celebrates uh, what you are, what you've done, and how you lead with purpose across Intel. So thank you very much for that. As we enter into this month of Black History Month, there are many events that Nia has put together to celebrate your ancestries and your history. And I'd like you to take a few steps uh, along the way uh, to help others understand it. So first of all, I urge all of you to go to uh, the BHM website to understand what is occurring across the many sites of Intel. Second thing is, as part of this celebration, bring somebody along with you to an event as you uh, explore the great uh, activities and events that have been created by the by the NIA leadership. I urge you to to also dip into your pockets if you can and and contribute uh, to colleges and universities that further promote the education uh, of 
blacks uh, across the, uh, the world and, and the U.S. And last but not least, uh, I'd like you to, as a manager to, to extend to your teams and communicate to your teams the celebration uh, that we are underway across Intel in Black History Month. Today is one of those events, and I think it's a, a fantastic uh, way to celebrate uh, the beginning of Black History Month. We're, we're honored uh, to have in our presence today uh, Jesse Russell, a known technologist uh, across the telecommunications industry that was known as the father of 2G technology. As many of you know, 5G technology is critical to our future, and Jesse still plays a huge role uh, in the propelling that technology as we begin to adopt. I think this is a great opportunity to not only celebrate your heritage, celebrate a great leader, but also integrate it into driving business results of Intel and how the confluence of all these things are critical. So. Again, I'd like to thank the NIA leadership team for, for bringing Jesse to us. And I hope today you have an amazing event uh, with him and begin our journey of celebrating this very important month in the history of, of our country. Thank you. Good morning. So I want to say thank you for our coming, for being here and the beautiful drums. We really appreciate having you. I want to say thank you to um, Robert Jarvis for his spoken word earlier to kick us off for Black History Month. I'm very, very excited to be here today. I am Dr. Ebony Chafee. I am in the Industrial Solutions Division within IOTG. And I am very honored to be here today to in introduce our guest speaker. Um, as Tom mentioned, as a part of our kickoff this, this year, there is a BHM website where you can go and get all the information on the events that are occurring and how you can contribute to our HBCUs and universities. And we're very excited to also um, have other ways that you can sponsor and support um, HBCUs across the world. Um, today, I am very excited to um, introduce Mr. Jesse Russell, who was the first African American to be um, hired from an HBCU at Bell Labs. Um, he has his bachelor's degree from Tennessee State. He also has his master's degree from Stanford. And you guys have seen all of the publicity that we've made around him today. I want to give him the opportunity to share his story with you. Um, so I am going to bring up Jesse Russell now so that he can speak to you. Um, we are very honored to have him here today. Mr. Russell, could you please join us? First of all, thank you so much for those kind remarks. And, and thank you for, for just being here today on such a special occasion in my judgment. I think that we don't celebrate a lot of things that African Americans have done in our country. And this is a month where you get a chance to see some of the things or hear from some of the people that have had impact uh, into driving innovation in America uh, across a variety of spectrums. I'm talking about cellular radio, but uh, you can see that as you heard in the earlier remarks, there are African Americans that are doing significant things all in a host of different technology, and probably here, I know for certain here in Intel as well, right? So you should be celebrating them uh, equally as well. Let, let me spend about uh, 10, 15 minutes just to share a perspective of what I chose to speak about today, which is this whole issue of why is inclusion uh, so important? And that many times, we look at different segments of our community, uh, and you can look at it from a variety of different uh, points, uh, and that I tend to think about it in the following way, which is cognitive diversity, and I'll talk about that in a minute, ethnic diversity, 
gender diversity and cultural diversity. And I believe fundamentally that what made America great is the blending of these things, is the blending of the people from different cultures. And I am fond of today, I have uh, eight grandkids and that six of them are ladies and that I, every day and every opportunity I get to speak to them, I talk about the value of uh, contribution that engineers have made to improving the quality of lives of other people. And I believe particularly women of color had tremendous insight uh, in terms of how they address things. I spoke about that this morning uh, with a group of uh, young people from HBCUs, and I wanted to encourage them and many of you that are in the audience. But I think women in general, we need to blend them into much higher levels because if you're not in the room why, where it happens, it typically will happen to you as opposed to for you. And so we've got to get more women uh, in that. But we need to get more African-American and other ethnic groups in those rooms to make sure we are talking about the right kinds of things that inspire, motivate, because that's what will drive the leadership in technology and innovation that has happened uh, within our country and continue to keep that. Because every single individual uh, within these various ethnic groups and gender, uh, as well as cultures, bring unique life stories to what they've done, what they're doing now that can inform, educate, and inspire. And, and I hope uh, you feel the same way as you interact throughout this month. There's something that I also like to talk about, which is I was in a meeting quite a few years back with a Bush appointee. Uh, he was an economist. And we were arguing about a point, or at least debating a point, like what happened first? Was it uh, what we call invention or was it discovery? And that what we tend to do, uh, what we argued about was, well, well, what was the beginning? Where did it all start at? And that my viewpoint is, is that if I look back into the age of telecommunications, it was Alexander Graham Bell, but then Bell came about and said, let me turn this into an economic cassette. But it was really uh, Alexander Graham Bell that says, well, can you hear me now, right? And as a result, it changed the world in terms of how we communicate over cable or over wires. Uh, but, but once you're able to come up with that unique idea, and there are special people in all of those gender groups that I taught, all those different groups that are ethnic, uh, women, uh, cultures, but most important and not or equally important is the way we think about things, uh, which I refer to as cognitive diversity. Getting people that have different life experiences sitting in the room and debating the idea, not the people, but just the idea. And that's so powerful in terms of how you can change and impact other people and bring our country much closer together than it is today. But if you can come up with the idea, then yeah, you go through invention, you go through the broad diffusion of the technology like you work here on Intel into productivity gains, economic growth, and wealth accumulation. But we want everyone to participate in the wealth accumulation, not just the chosen few. And the way we do that is by dialogue among people that are different than yourself and your ability to walk in the shoes of someone else uh, that may be different uh, than you. Another point that I talk about, I'm just giving you some broad thoughts of things that I've had and you'll get a chance or others will get a chance to ask me questions and hopefully I'll give you a deeper understanding of the things that are important. I'm not going to be able to get into a lot of the technology things that I wanted to talk about being at Intel, but I will tell you one story before I go to this slide. Many people don't know this, but when I was a young student at Stanford University, uh, Intel had invented something called microprocessors, and the very first one, I don't know how many people in here know this, but the first one was the 4004, and then after that was like the 8008. Uh, but I was so impressed with Intel at the time in that technology that I became so good at it. Uh, it was amazing. It was difficult to program, I have to tell you. It was very difficult to program. But I stayed at it, and I worked at, at Stanford in the lab, and I continued to work, and I got very good at it. So when I went back to, uh, Be to the Bell System, which is where I started my career, uh, I started to tell everybody about Intel and these new microprocessor devices, and I built some of the first uh, data collection systems based on Intel's 8080 processor that actually allowed the United, I mean, allowed AT&T to manage the entire global 
uh, telecommunications network as a part of the Bell system. Most people in Intel didn't know. So I have a special place in my heart for Intel. So when they asked me to come to Intel to speak, I said, hey, Intel got me going because I, I ended up becoming very uh, uh, accomplished inside of the Bell system because I got started with microprocessors that were invented at, at Intel. But what, what I do now and what I've done most of my career is to understand uh, something that is really important to me is what I call the half-life of perceived personal information value. And I said the challenge that we have in the communication space is how do we move intelligence from one person to the next faster? And, and that the longer it takes information to get from one person to the next the less valuable the information. So I've dedicated my career to driving and inventing new things that will allow us to improve the movement of information from one person to the next. But there's an equally competing aspect of this that I tend to talk about, uh, which is called the inconvenience threshold. The harder it is to get access to information, the less likely you will do it. But the foundation of changing the economic environment within our country and the success that we've had in our country on technology innovation and leading the world in innovation and technology is because we continue to drive this, the, this particular curve. And that if you look at the bottom of it, and I'm fond of saying, if you go all the way back to the Pony Express of what we call the physical era, People would actually enter a letter in. By the time the person on the east on the west coast got the letter, the person had passed away, right? So, so, it, it, so Theodore uh, Bell, Alexander Graham Bell, and what they wanted to do was so powerful uh, because people could now start to communicate across huge boundaries. And then people like me came along. And we started to ask the question, is it fast enough? Should we move it faster? Uh, and, and all of a sudden, you saw the explosion of so. But I, because I went to an HBCU, I got the kind of training and support that says you are valuable and you can have an impact on not just the people at Tennessee State University, but much broader than that. And my dream was to go and work at Bell Laboratories as a young engineer. Many people thought that, oh, they don't take people from HBCUs. I hope you don't have that culture at Intel because Bell Labs made a great investment, and they got a good return out of having me there, let me assure you, when you look at the value of digital cellular communications. But, but where we are today, right, is that I'm going to flip through because we don't have much time, and I know you want to ask me a lot of questions, but I'm going to flip through just to give you a history of the whole evolution of the wireless communications industry. Uh, it really started back in 1947 with a guy named Doug Ring, where he came up with the basic idea. And I actually, it's not the same phone, but I, I use this phone. This may shock some of you that, that are the early vintage, where, where you say, how could you? We worked with two manufacturers that built these things. One was Oki in Japan, and the other one was Motorola. And that th this is so clever. Uh, this is one of a very limited number of these. This happened to be the one that was given to me based on my contributions to wireless communications. But it, it looked like the old, those of you who have been around long, this looked like the old 500 set and that you talk like this. But this mounted at the, in the base of your car, uh, right, on the hump that we used to call it in the old days, right? But it had tremendous mechanical technology, right, in it that allow you to adjust it. We locked it down where, just like we worry about today, we're having accidents. Because we worried about all those things way back then, right? But it's a very interesting device in terms of how we did. But uh, if you take a look at Dick Frank Kill, these are people that I, I work with, Joel Engel. These were people before me that did the analog system. And then I came along. Uh, and I look different here than I did then, right? <laughs> but, but that's okay, right? Uh, hopefully you'll, you'll let me get by with that one. But, but, <laughs> but, that, but that's me, right? But then I came along and I asked an interesting question. I, I was in a room, and, and this is what inclusion means to me. I was in a room. I was the only black person in the room. Uh, and that it was a Jewish uh, boss that I had. And he said, hey, look, we've got this cellular thing. We don't know what to do with it, right? We had just broke up the Bell system. They sent it back to AT&T. Uh, the people were put in the back of the building. And he wanted me to go back there and say, well, could, could you do something with this? And the first thing that I did, I went back and I said, well, what's the problem? Uh, and I was talking to them because I didn't know anything about cellular radio. 
Uh, but I said, what's the problem? And they said, well, when these, because of these phones, like this, a little different at that time, said so when we, only time we can make money is when someone dials you and you're in the car. I said, oh man, that's a simple problem to solve, right? Why don't we just take the phone out of the car and put it on the people? No matter where they go, they'll have the phone. And it, it's like the brother from the hood, right? I said, no matter where they go, they, 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 when I call them, they'll answer it and I'll make a dollar because it's like a dollar and something every time you answer the phone, whether you talked or not. I said, we could turn the business around. And then people started to look at me like this guy clearly was put here for affirmative action, not to lead us, right? Okay, <laughs> you know? but, but as they heard me speak about digital signal processing, then they started to understand, wait a minute, this guy's not crazy. Maybe we can build a digital system that would allow us to minimize the size, make the cost. But many people don't know why I said that. And I was telling the group this morning, I said it was very simple to me because where I came from, in my community, people didn't have cars. We caught the bus and then we rode around and we walked. And I said that, why shouldn't our people have access to this technology? And, and that people started to, and the reason I like to show this chart, I just have a couple more and then we'll break, is a gentleman on here named Marty Cooper. And that because I was a young, some people thought I was a little arrogant, right? Because I thought I could do anything. But Tennessee State taught me that I could do anything because they believed in me, then I felt that was the most important thing, right? So when I went into communities like the ones you see here at Intel, but at that time it was Bell Labs and AT&T, oh, well, only the people can work here are from MIT and Stanford. Okay, then I'll go to Stanford because I wanna work here because I think I can contribute here because this is what I want to do. And, and as a result, I got the opportunity. But the, when I was young and I came up with this whole concept of taking phones out of cars and putting them on people, which is a simple idea, it was just common sense if you think about it, right? Uh, that Marty Cooper and them was, uh, was from Motorola and that we, as I said before, we worked with two groups and that they had put me up against Marty Cooper because he was like the giant in our industry and you had this young kid, brass, and felt that he could do anything and they put me in and said, this is past, present, and future. But then when I started to talk about why I felt we should take the phones out of the cars and put them on people, and why we should move toward digital cellular communications and drive down the cost, who can pay $3,000 just to own a phone, right? Forget about using it, right? You know, just to own it. I said, nobody in my community could do that. But this is where inclusion matters. Because if I had not been sitting in that room with someone else other than somebody that looked like me uh, or that was either from a different culture or a different gender would have said that? Maybe, maybe not, but I was there and I said it. And it changed the course of moving phones away from places and putting them on people. And today, I walk around and there, when I was doing that and saying to people, well, nobody wants this thing on them ringing all the time because they were thinking of a different era, right? Like the phone ringing in your home or the phone ringing on your desktop. And now, my God, the phone is ringing in my pocket, right? You know, what am I going to do? And I said, no, you don't know what happens if they're lost, what happens if they're in a dangerous situation. They could call help. They could do a lot of things. There's a lot of benefits to having it on them. But, but it was not an easy struggle. But we started in 1984, and we fought to, to bring about digital cellular communications. For four years, I fought that. And I had to go up against uh, people like Marty. And now Marty and I sat on a committee at the FCC Technology Advisory Council with the chairman of the FCC, and we're the best of friends. We just celebrated his 90th birthday. Two different people from two different environments. He believed that, look, we've got to do more for Native Americans. We've got to do more for people in rural communities. I talk about people in underserved communities, and now Marty and I are collaborating on how we can do that, where we were in two different spaces earlier on, and now we're coming together. So inclusion matters, right? when you walk in somebody else's shoes and you see how they feel when you say this or when you say that, and you don't know what they're gonna say in a meeting, but they might say something that could inform, which is what happened in this case. Another gentleman, this guy was from India. I'm trying to give you a feeling of dealing with different cultural environments, different perspectives. This gentleman, uh, David and I became great friends 
uh, I was pushing digital cellular communication. I said, well, we need to broaden this outside of the United States. I was having trouble in the United States because people didn't believe in what I was talking about. And so we, he got me an opportunity to speak before the Nordic country in Europe, where I talked about this, and the rest of it is history. But David and I became friends over many years, because, and then all of a sudden in Europe, they started to move toward digital cellular as well, which helped the United States. This is one of the most challenging issues that I face, is that no one had ever built a linear, high-powered RF amplifier. And, and I said, we need to move toward digital modulation schemes. How can we do that? And, and that this thing looked like an air, an air jet engine, right? <laughs> and so people say, what the heck is this thing, right? You know, and you had this young black guy, right, saying, this is the future, right? And people it said, it looks like a old jet engine to me, right? But I'm telling you, it's the future. It was the future. It was the future. And, and so you've got to be careful about criticizing people that are different than you. You have to be careful with that, right? Because I was right, it was the future. But I didn't know it was the future, but nor did they. But they thought it wasn't the future because of the messenger, right? Not the technology. And, and, and all I would say to you, just be careful with that. And after we came out with the first digital cellular base, state, everybody said, and that's what's shown at the bottom, everyone started to, to, to copy what we were doing. This is the last one that, that I'll leave you with. We had done a lot of the work, and if you look at a lot of my early patents, some, a gentleman was talking to me the other day. Oh, wait a minute, I saw one of your patents is very similar to some things that we're doing. And I said uh, that if you were to look at your cell phone today, and you'll notice that you have like a Wi-Fi uh, and, and a LTE notification on your phone, uh, we did a patent on that in, 19, in 2008, which is dual radio private and public cellular networks. In my judgment, in 2002 or 2003, when we filed the patent, did I claim that's gonna be the next big thing? But we didn't see something that Steve Jobs saw, which was tremendous, and that is cross-sector innovation. We spend too much time focusing our own stovepipes of what we do, and I think you're probably saying that the same thing at Intel, and that we're gonna be talking to Intel about some of the new things that we're doing in enterprise cellular communications, where we can leverage some of the new work that Intel is doing in processor technology, that we think by bringing what we're doing for the federal government together with what Intel's technology capability will transform some of the things that Intel is doing uh, with, with processor technology and looking at new markets uh, for that technology. But this gentleman forced me to start to think outside of the box because he saw the need for palm top computing in cellular radio. And you do know what happened today with the phenomena of smartphones? Just about 70, 80% of the value creation in cellular radio in terms of extracting a profits come from what the gentleman did. Because he was willing to look outside of working on computing platforms, but looked at the cellular communication space. And so I would challenge Intel, and I'll close with this, I would challenge Intel I certainly understand that you're the greatest company around in terms of processor technology, and we are awe at what you can do. But I would ask you to think about applying that in different other segments, and maybe in the ones that I'm talking about now that's emerging. It's not there yet, but that's what made you great. And I'll go back to the 4,000, close back to the 4,004 uh, and the 8,008. That never would have hit the Bell system to do some of the things that I had done if they didn't come to Stanford and showed a young black guy like me, oh, here's these new things. There was a lot of other people in the class, not just me, but I liked it. I thought it was really cool that I could sit there and program that technology and have it do things. And as a result, we took it and actually put the first microprocessor-based system into the Bell system that was used to monitor the, the entire telecommunications network for AT&T simply because I was sitting in a classroom uh, at Stanford University and Intel chose to reach out to university. So just to close, I would say to the leadership in Intel, reach out to the HBCUs because the return on your investment may be much more than you think. And I bet you there are people just like me that are sitting in those universities that can transform the kinds of things that you can do or you can, are doing, or at least give you a different perspective about how to leverage and exploit your technology. Uh, so I, let me stop there, and that I think we're scheduled to go into sort of a Q&A.
Uh, I, I was going to show you this to get into new technology, but I, I don't have enough time. But I would leave you with this one last thought since I punched this up, which I hadn't planned to. But uh, many of you have heard about uh, small cell technology. Do you know when the first one of those were built? I bet you don't. And that the gentleman that you're looking at this picture, we did it in 1998. Uh, and that we couldn't get it built in the United States. We had to go to Canada to have it built. And we built the first, that was the first conversion, front end conversion radio. We, had, we were only converting 10 megahertz uh, bandwidth, which is, was tremendous at the time, right? I mean, obviously, you can do a lot more of that today with the kind of processing technology that Intel was doing. But the first ones were done uh, back in 1998. And then they broke up the Bell system. I mean, they, they, they spun out ATT Wireless Services, and then I decided to retire. Uh, and I decided to go and, and push it on my own. And so right now, we are leading in a new area called Enterprise Cellular Communications, uh, where we are building private cellular networks, not Wi-Fi networks. These are cellular networks that are secure, uh, that interact with public cellular networks. And there's some interesting things there that I think Intel ought to take a look at because it's the emerging area. Yes, Cisco dominates the enterprise router and switcher platform, but nobody is driving small cell technology with, with the new types of things that we're doing in the enterprise, uh, which is a whole new area that Intel may very well be interested in exploring. Uh, but but uh, th that's it, and I assume we can go to the question and answer at this point, unless... Uh, yeah. uh, I, oh, is that okay? Did I, did I run over my time? No, yeah. you're good. Oh, okay, I was trying, I was watching job. the thing. <laughs> We're going to sit over here. Oh, okay. I'm going to encourage the audience to get in line. If you have questions, we're going to mix it up. I'm going to ask a few, and we're going to take some questions from the, the audience here. Um, great job in your 15 minutes. Kind oh, of well, uh, I stayed at 15 minutes. That yes, was the thing yeah. you wanted to make you sure did I great. 15 minutes. I did that. Um, so I want to keep piling on to what you were saying about Intel's technology, right? Yeah, sure. So considering you are a thought leader in wireless communications and um, you're actually even looking into 6G uh, to some level, right? Yeah, yeah, that's we right. We want to understand, right. like, where do you see our 5G strategy matching up when we talk about AI and edge computing? How do you see that connecting? Well, when I, when I this goes back a few years, some of my guys in, in the company had looked at the processing technology that you guys were working on. And what we wanted to do is, was to move uh, processing with faster DDAs and A to Ds to get closer to the antenna mm -hmm. uh, because of the work that we had done with direct radio conversion back in 1998. Mm -hmm. But we couldn't take it to where we wanted to take it to because uh, we did not have the processing capability at that time. Mm -hmm. And so they would say, well, Intel has got this atom processor and they're, 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 they're moving down their belt at, uh, at the time they told me, I think they're at 14 nanometers. Mm -hmm. So I said, ah, that's not enough, right? <laughs> you know, for what I want to do, right? And then uh, I was so impressed uh, last night because I was meeting with several people in the community last night. And they said, no, no, man, we're down to like 10 and we're pushing seven. I said, we need to talk to you guys Absolutely. right here. <laughs> so uh, but I, I called my uh, chief technical officer and said, hey, we got to find a way to meet with Intel because they're starting to get into the territory where we can now, be, for the first time, start to build uh, enterprise private cellular networks uh, by actually uh, moving processing closer to the antenna, doing direct conversion, and being able to not just do what Intel is doing today, uh, with uh, doing um, band, con what we call spectral band co um, consolidation, uh, aggregation is a better way to put it, because we're doing something neat, what's called stack spectrum, where we're looking at non-contiguous channels mm -hmm. and actually combining those, right? Uh, and as a result, building lower cost infrastructure Absolutely. to go into buildings that would drive down the cost of cellular communications in private settings. So the way he describes it last night when we were discussing, it, it, it's really what IoT is referring to as workload consolidation, right? How do you aggregate workloads and, and really synergize some of the um, boxes that are in the market yes. so that you can reduce costs? So we have a lot to discuss. And, um, <laughs> okay, that, that works <laughs> Thank for me, you. right? <laughs> Thank you for me. that. Um, uh, well, then I did a good job of did. getting your attention you last great, night, right? You did a great okay. job. <laughs> no problem. Um, the next question um, is... Graduating from an HBCU, um, sure. as you have, and then, and then going to Stanford, I mean, yeah, Stanford and then uh, moving to Bell Labs, those are completely different environments and yes. ecosystems, right, yes. that have uh, different cultures and that have different levels of value of inclusion and diversity. Absolutely. Um, I want to hear from you. Um, 
how that transition worked for you and, okay. and based on where we are today in our society, what thoughts you have on what we need to really um, drive and lead within okay. our own um, company here. Well, let me start with uh, Tennessee State University. I, and some people get a, a little mixed up on this one. I say it was very nurturing environment. Uh, don't misunderstand the word nurturing, mm. right? Uh, what they gave me was a safe space where I could be who I really was mm -hmm. and that I didn't have to worry about what other people thought about who I was mm -hmm. and what I could do. And so I had the freedom of thought uh, to pursue what I wanted to pursue because mm -hmm. of the cultural environment that I was in. Then when I left from there and I went to uh, Stanford, it's like coming out of a warm, nurturing environment and then being dropped into cold water, right? <laughs> you know? Because people had trouble relating to us, mm -hmm. right? Because it was in, in the early 70s, there wasn't a lot of us at Stanford University. Right. And as a result of that, we started to say, well, look, we have to survive, right? And how do we survive here? And then we started to form groups of networking, similar to what you guys are doing mm -hmm. in Intel here, right? In terms of the African American or black community. And so we started to help each other through the different classes. So we created our own nurturing environment because a lot of us came from HBCU, so we knew how to do it. Right. So we actually did it in a different place. Yes. And then I, I did very well coming out of, of Stanford. Maybe I should have stayed in Silicon Valley. I would have been a lot richer <laughs> right then than going back to AT&T, right? But, but, we, uh, the, but then when I went to AT&T, it was like when, when I talk about this concept of uh, cognitive diversity, mm -hmm different thought. I had not been in an environment where people were coming from all over the world. Mm -hmm. I was competing with people from India, from Africa, from mm -hmm. India. I had never had to do that mm -hmm. before, right? And as a result of being there, the thing that I, I thought was the most inspiring thing of being there was that because I was in that diverse environment, mm -hmm. what happened was that we had to create this rule where you could debate an idea without attacking the person. Right. And as we started to, to preach that, right, within Bell Labs, by having different groups come together and start to push back on the people that controlled and dominated everything, right. then people started to listen to us. Right. And, and when, they, when they started to listen to us, the synergy of the ideas, and I, I talked about this some in that chart, where, where all of us have, as, as Obama said, all of us have compelling life experiences. But it gets magnified mm -hmm. when you bring people from other countries and yes. so forth involved, how they think about things, how they solve problems. Yes. And as a result, if you look at, at the kind of uh, contribution, we were doing like a patent a day, mm -hmm. if you look at some of these. And you look at the number of patents that I have. The you one I was showing you. Right? Yeah, you have over 100, right? But there are, there are many other African Americans that are out of that Bell Labs that have over 100. So mm -hmm. I'm not unique in this. Mm -hmm. but it was the cultural environment of idea sharing and interacting of people from different cultures give you ideas of things that you hadn't thought about, right? Exactly. Uh, because of where you came from, right? Exactly. And, and those, that synergistic culture actually stimulated innovation, both technology leadership. It was unfortunate that they shut that down, right? But the, uh, and you can see the impact of shutting that down as it relates to where uh, the United States is relative to technology leadership yeah. and innovation yes. uh, because of, of that environment. Uh, if, if you have created that environment at Intel, mm -hmm. I employ you to keep it. Keep it. it. Yes, it costs money to do it. Yeah. But if you keep it and nurture it, you will get the return on that investment much beyond what you could ever imagine. And that's what happened at at and It was unfortunate. They chose to break it up, right? Mm -hmm. But uh, no, it, it was a difficult transition. The, the hot water, the warm water to the cold water was yes. the most shocking one, right? Yes. But actually, by the time I came out of Stanford, I had seen enough different people. I wasn't intimidated by being inside of Bell Laboratory. Yes, the people were incredibly bright, right? But the, the cognitive diversity of that environment was so powerful, mm -hmm. it made me better. It made me better, and I kept getting better and better. So you were better. able to embrace it. And, yes, and, and I, I became an integral part of it. Absolutely. And, that, and the example, I'm sorry to, to long answer your question, but just to respond to your, your, the question earlier, when I was uh, debating this issue of, of digital cellular, yeah. and I was fighting with these guys about, 
no, this is so important that we got to put these phones on people. Yes. Nobody believed that was a good idea, right? right? Nobody believed we should do that because people would rebel, right, right. against that. And then the, some of my arch rivals started to say, maybe this guy's not so nuts after all, right? right? So you we, found cold travelers. Yeah, well, but, well, we got cold travelers because I was transforming them, losing a job to creating a job, <laughs> yes. right? Yes. So the other said, no, that's a good idea, yes. right? So we need to, yeah, we do need to embrace it, right? Because we're going out of business, exactly. right? And so what I was talking about, how we stay in business, yes. right? And so, yeah, no. Technology yeah. meeting business case always absolutely, has to happen. Absolutely, absolutely. We have a question from the audience. Oh, okay. I don't, okay. Uh, first, thank you for being here. Okay. Uh, just uh, being a shining example of what we can achieve oh, thank you. today. And, you know, it's just an amazing um, legacy that you have so far established. Sure. And I saw a lot of first, <laughs> the first to do, yeah. right? Yes. I, I would like to know out of all your firsts, if you could think of like one or two that are at the top of your list of, you know, uh, gratification like this, because with such a plethora of what you've done, mm. there may be some stuff rises to the top of uh, contributions to our society. I mean, yeah. Sure, so sure. what gives you the most reward and... Yeah, I, I, I think because I've seen things that I'm working on and done that that is not because I haven't written about it yet. <laughs> so you haven't seen. But I would okay. point lots of people believe uh, digital cellular because uh, most people can see, feel and touch the impact of that. Right. As they walk around and make telephone calls or or texts or whatever. But if I were to pick the, the thing that I believe will be the most impactful uh, is what I'm working on now. Uh, the ability to transform uh, closed places, which are buildings and homes. Uh, if you look at my work in 5G, which we refer to as infrastructure-centric technology, where we're building private radio systems that are communicating through high bandwidth channels to smart endpoints uh, that you can monitor, extract data, move data, check the health of the environments in which we operate and live. And the new work that I'm doing in human-centric human -centric, uh, technology where we want to attack the healthcare system by building wireless homes where we are using plantables, uh, uh, embeddables and wearables and plantables uh, on people where we can extract health conditions on a going on basis uh, but the challenges that we have in moving into those arenas is the security of the information. So we're doing some very interesting work now. I, I hate to get into too much technology stuff. We're doing some very interesting work now in the control plane layer, not just the data plane, but the control plane layer where we're creating security channels in there where you can secure data transmission from different endpoint devices by using something we call virtual network layering, which is a new technology that, that we're working on. Uh, that, uh, that I think if I were to pick and you could say, well, I've never heard of that, so I don't think that's the most important thing <laughs> no, that no, you've done. To you, <laughs> but, to you. I but, but, that, but I have, sir. right? I've been on, working on it since 2010, <laughs> yeah. right? So, so, but it just hasn't gotten there yet, and we got the challenges of trying to get that into the marketplace, and we're trying to do that. Right? Awesome. But Thank that's you. the one I would pick out of all the ones that I've been a part of. Exciting. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Another question from the audience. Again, thank you for coming and didn't, you know, talking to you at dinner last night was uh, great also. But one of the things I, I noticed in your, in your material is you talked about the speed of information and sharing it and getting it from person to person to person. Sure. There's an upside to that, obviously, which is people can do it, and we've actually democratized information. Absolutely. But I think that, right, because you think about 25 years ago, it was basically three channels that controlled the news you got. Right. And now you get all kind of news. But then the flip side of the speed is that people don't feel the obligation to even be right or accurate. Right. Like, you know, one of the things that recently everybody's talking about is you think about people said Rick, Fo Rick Fox was on the plane with Kobe or on the helicopter with Kobe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. How do you feel about the speed? And do you ever think it's too fast? Because now everybody wants to be first yeah. and they're reporting you know, Hort, you know, Rick Fox said his family was distraught because some people thought he was on that yeah, helicopter. And he wasn't, right? Yeah, and he wasn't. Yeah. Yeah. So I guess my question to you is, do you ever think that 
do you ever have any tension in your system about the velocity of information and the fact that it's democratized and that velocity creates a lot of misinformation? Well, well obviously, answer your, your last part of your question is absolutely true, right? Uh, but you have to balance it. I hate to sound like a technologist, right? but, but I am, right? And, and that, that That's my, fine. My, you hear it in <laughs> so, Totally okay. You know, I'm not a philosopher, <laughs> but I am, I'm a technologist, right? You know, so and so uh, if you pardon me for being that, right? But, mm-hmm. but what I would say to you, that there are, are two pieces to that. That if you go back to one of the things that I said about the transitioning from physical to wired to wireless in terms of <clears> these transformations, uh, I think people that do what I do are, have an obligation to deliver the best that they can do to the broader public. But I don't know that I should take the responsibility for how people choose to use what I do, yeah. right? And, but what I would say, which is exactly where I think you, I think you were going, is, is where does the responsibility lie for the use of information mm-hmm. and to, to take the time to educate yourself on what you're hearing such that you can make intelligent decisions about the value of it or the accuracy of it. Mm-hmm. And I, I think one of the, 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 putting that on the technologists, I would push back, right? Okay. But I put it on the individuals that are the recipients of the technology because it's all, I always argue more is better, right? Because if I get more, I can actually discern what might be true or not. At least I can see the conflicts. As a technologist, my job is to see discontinuities. If I look at anything that I've invented up to this point, the power of what I've done is because I observed something that was different here and, and than it was over here, and as a result, I can connect the dots, right? <laughs> and do, but no, in terms of what I do, I, I would still err on the side of saying uh, more is better, uh, more is better, but I would put the responsibility on the end user that you have to educate yourself by looking at all the sources of information that we're, that we're flying at you through social media and to be able to discern to the best of your ability, you won't always know that, but to the best of your ability. But I can tell you something technologically that we're doing, which is, which is to create these virtual channels where we take, uh, uh, from a security point of view, where we actually force you to identify the source of that information coming to the person by using biometrics at the endpoints where we actually don't allow people to use their device without actually giving us the credentials. And, and you look at the new work that we're doing, we're saying, no, you, you're right to register your phone, you're right to get the authorization, but we're saying that the network should have the right to do security certification on the source of the information mm-hmm. to you, mm-hmm. uh, such that you can now judge from those sources which one you think, right, is the correct one. But I would not err on the side of of reducing the amount of information that we deliver. I would err on the other side of giving you all the information uh, such that you can make uh, intelligent decisions about the value of it and the usefulness of it. Thank you. Yeah, sure. We have another question from the audience. Hi. um, (coughs) Sure. Thanks for for sharing with us. Um, I also worked at the phone company with a much shorter and less illustrious career as you, but one thing I noticed on your slides was that you worked through uh, 1984 with the Judge Green uh, breakup of AT&T, and um, maybe a policy question more than a technology question, but uh, did you have thoughts or um, stories about that experience and, and that kind of breakup and maybe reflected on today when we have a lot of very large technology companies and whether maybe that um, could have parallels to today or not. Sure, sure. Well, well, something you may not know, I was one of the people selected by the Bell System to testify before Judge Green on the breakup of the Bell System, so I was immensely involved in it. It was, uh, there was a few of us, right? One of my very f- uh, close friends was uh, uh, Arnold Penzias, which you may or may not have heard about. He won the Nobel Prize f- uh, for the Big Bang Theory. But uh, Arnold and I both testified in that I, I received, actually received an award. I'm glad you brought, I received an award from George Saunders, which was the lead attorney for, for, the, Bell, for the Bell system against the Justice Department. And that what I, why people noticed me was 
I was one of the few people that went before Judge Green that he didn't think was a bad AT&T person, right? <laughs> he actually talked to me and he asked me questions and so forth, right? But I, but I, I felt that the break it up from a policy point of view was a really bad idea. And, and I think uh, this gets back to the previous question about information that is accurate or not accurate, right, that you're receiving. I think a lot of the information that was coming out because I was responsible for delivering those special service circuits that went to uh, MCI. Uh, and it's one of the reasons I think I was one of the people that were testifying in that what I can tell you today, we were delivering quality loops to them. It wasn't what was being communicated. We were delivering quality loops. But the impact of making that political decision caused the demise of something that I knew and loved, which was the Bell Labs environment, where we were creating technologies that were beyond your wildest dream. Uh, and as a result, and I'm sure you could say, well, Xerox Park was doing that, and a bunch of other people were doing the same thing, since you know a little bit about the Bell system. But I think it was a strategic mistake for the federal government and AT&T to break it up uh, because they lost a treasure trove of innovation, ideas, and technology leadership for our country. And we have struggled since that time to get it back. So I think to inform the policymakers, uh, you should need to talk to a periphery of people <laughs> before you start to make policy decisions because you don't know what you are breaking when you're trying to fix something, right? In that case, they were fixing the wrong thing in my judgment because we were delivering quality loops, right? But the other side was able to convince them that we were not, right? And, and they, they won. And as a result, uh, we, we got broken up into seven R box and the rest of it is history, right? <laughs> but yeah, no, I was actually involved in that. That was the first breakup. But we had a few more after that, but that was the first one. Thank you. Oh, we have, oh. I didn't see this side oh, of the room okay. over here. Let me scan. <laughs> sorry, sorry. Let me sorry scan. That, um, no. I'll ask my question after this, and then okay. we'll go to okay. this young no. lady. Yes, sir. Okay. Um, Jesse, I was uh, fortunate to work in the Bell Labs soon after you left. I joined in 99, so we didn't work together. Uh, and I have seen the breakup and the, the way Lucent failed to be yep. continued. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, but at the same time, as you mentioned, the Apple came into the phone market very quickly, being in a different segment. So now with Intel, as you are saying that same model may not work, but what tips you want to give to us so that we can also collaborate across the different segment to be more successful in other segment other than the our regular PC and server segment? How do we get into adjacent yeah. markets yeah. beyond right. traditional? Yeah, no, yeah, uh, thanks. I, I, I think I, I got the. the We've got to be careful to, uh, and I, I'm certainly not trying to inform the leadership team in Intel because I have <laughs> tremendous respect for them, right? but, but we have to be careful when we move into markets with blinders on. Mm. We have to be careful with that, right? And, and this is the point I was making about inclusion and because I think that sometimes we, we know what the right path is and that when the centers raise their voices, we move them to the side, right? Even though they're within the same organization. And that one of the things, that, and, and we, we produce a lot of innovation in my organization. We had like the advanced um, uh, communications technology group inside of, of Bell Laboratories, inside of at and And the way I was able to achieve it, the most, the people that thought the worst about the idea that we were making, I said, great, we'd love to have you on this team, and what we want you to do is beat them, <laughs> okay? Come up with a better idea than what they've got, right? Exactly. You know, and, and as a result, but don't say, well, well, we're just going down this road, and, and, and the, it's like blinders, and there is no other road that we can go down. Uh, the, as, as I was talking earlier about the smartphone uh, revolution, what was done there is what we're doing now, if you look at the work that I'm doing now, right, is that this whole idea of cross-sector innovation is going to be a powerful phenomenon and that it will force the leadership team, or whether it's Intel or AT&T or Rodney, whatever, to look at things much different than they have in the past. If they don't, uh, that you're going to see even more casualties, right, in terms of American technology companies, right? If we're not broadening our sight and letting our people have the freedom to think outside of the lines or the lanes that we put them in, right? 
And the, the, right now, until I came out here last night, I, I did not know that Intel could actually help us with what we're trying to do to secure data for the federal government, which yeah. the federal government is seriously concerned about right now. But I learned that last night, but I wouldn't have known that if somebody hadn't invited me here, right. thanks to you guys, right? If you hadn't invited me here to talk to me and then tell me what you guys are doing and how I could compare that with what we're doing, right? I need to do a time check. Yeah. Um, five minutes is left in our session. Okay. Um, I'm going to allow these two questions and to we go. We're going to get your question, quick. right? It's okay. <laughs> okay, that's okay. We want, okay, we no want the audience to be yeah. able to ask theirs. Well, um, I, I think two things. One is uh, a story, a little bit of a story. Mm -hmm. And I joined uh, the technical community about 30 years ago, just okay. over 30 okay. years ago. And I worked for a telecom company mm -hmm. making uh, terminating equipment. And one of the trips I went on was back to New York City to okay. uh, meet with a technician back there who was working with our equipment. And he had his mobile cell phone. <laughs> okay. And it was totally a brick. It, it uh, maybe three bricks. Because he pulled it out of his car, and <laughs> and yeah. I think the battery pack was two bricks, yeah, and the I, phone I, was I, one I brick. know it. I know the phone, but keep on going. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, he was very proud of that, and I guess that's the beginning of what I saw in the, the mm -hmm. mobile space as our company was selling equipment into that. Um, but the other thing I wanted to say is that our company had probably saw, saw divestiture as an opportunity. Sure. So we had many more opportunities than we would have had if Bell had stayed that one entity. It was, from our perspective, yeah. it wasn't changing. Even though you were focused on the loops, as you say, and better quality, we probably wouldn't have seen the change we see now after 30 years of where we're at with cell phone technology now. Sure. That's comment. No, no, no I, I think you, you, we, we may not, uh, I, I think if your point is that competition is a good yeah. thing, right? Yeah. And uh, you, can, you can create systems, if you, and I know many people thought the Bell system was one entity, but no, there were many different entities inside the Bell system. Uh, and that Bell Laboratories was isolated out in that many of the people in Bell Laboratories was working on different segments. So we competed fiercely, right, uh, on technology. Uh, the, the, and as a result, I think we create a lot of things as a result of that, but I, I don't necessarily believe that you have to break it up no. but I think in it order to achieve those things, I right? I think it, it greatly accelerated change because then it opened up other opportunities that might not have been there. Well, the only, the only, I, I just want to make one comment about which, let me share this with you because I was there just like you were there for some of the time. One of the things that they told us, they said, well, this is a, um, a carrier and what we need is speed boats. <laughs> That's great, right? Except when they start crashing into each uh, other, right? Uh, oh yeah. <laughs> you know, so well, the, yeah. the question is, if you want to have speed boats, there's nothing wrong with that, right? But if, if you're crashing all the time, crashing because we can't the manage whole them, infrastructure then it's change yeah, to accommodate so, uh, it. You bet. Look, destruction is much harder than construction. Let me assure you. <laughs> <laughs> last question, last short answer before we yeah. run out of time. <laughs> <laughs> we say she's the out of time, right? No. <laughs> Hi, Jesse. My name is Tori Orr. Thank you so much for being here. Your talk was extremely inspiring. Mm -hmm. um, I, too, also experienced the interesting dichotomy of going to both an HBCU and a PWI. So I went to Spelman College in Atlanta, Georgia, and also okay, the okay. University of Michigan in Ann Arbor. Mm -hmm. And I heard you speak on how a lot of who you are was developed at TSU, sure. but then when you went to Stanford, um, Intel was there and they let you program on their processors and that's kind of where you got hands on. And I know you said that Intel should um, consider recruiting more at HBCUs and I think that Intel does a great job at recruiting at HBCUs. Okay. I was just wondering, is there anything additional that you think Intel and other like tech companies can do? Um, because like you said, um, at Stanford, you were able to actually get your hands on the processors and start um, coding. And mm -hmm. at Michigan, you know, I, I too was able to you do things that, like yeah. that. So yeah. I just wanted to know if you had any thoughts on that. Yeah, yeah no, I, what I would say, invest and invest and invest because you don't know what you don't know. And I bet you money there is incredible talent at HBCUs that will educate and inform Intel senior management if you just let them come in. Mm -hmm. And the way you invest is exactly what you did at Stanford for guys like me, right? And ladies that were doing the same. I just happened to take a liking for microprocessors, right? But 
if, if you had taken and put that same environment that was at Stanford at Tennessee State University, I bet you money I would have accomplished the same things, right? But they, they didn't have an Intel microprocessor set up at, at Tennessee State. They had it at Stanford, right? And that what I would recommend to Intel, reach out and touch people outside of your closed sort of crystal environment, right? And that you will find rich input. And she says, I have to stop talking right now. <laughs> Because we want to thank you for being okay, here with okay, us today okay, you can, you can and ending our webcast. Thank okay. you so much for joining us. We really appreciate it. Please give a round of applause for Jesse. Thank you. Thank you. We really appreciate it so much.